which is stimulating. And I'm sure we'll go back home with, with a, a more open mind and a more bigger picture of what we do. So as, um, as Matteo was saying, this is the laser? The laser is, oh no. Okay. So as, as Matteo was saying, I work at ICGB. It's located in Trieste. Okay. So it's very similar in, in mandate and concept to ICTP. Uh, we were we were actually, we were uh, born in 1987 as a as a project of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and and we were so we were we were that project until 1995. And from 1995, we are, we are uh, an independent intergovernmental organization, and our mandate is to to try and do good science, but all, but also remembering that we have a, a duty to, to uh, promote biotechnology in developing countries and also doing training, uh, training scientists and, and promoting uh, this technology. Uh, so in order to make sure that also developing countries would benefit from this technology. In fact, when it was uh, created in the 80s, biotechnology was, you know, genetic engineering biotechnology was, was, was the revolution. So we wanted to make sure that also, developing countries will benefit from this new technology. So we are an organization that is composed of three uh, different institutes, okay? Um, one in Trieste here, which is also the headquarters. Uh, and then we have, a, we call them components. So we're a global research organization. So we have a component in New Delhi in India, which is actually born at the same time in also 1987, like Trieste. And then in 2007, we created a new component in Cape Town, South Africa, because you know, since, since it was created in the 80s, we have to, we have to uh, admit and, and very happily admit that a lot of countries, developing countries, have made incredible progress. You know, countries like India cannot be regarded as developing in terms of biotechnology. They're now leaders in the field. Whereas African, uh, the African continent, in our view, is lagging behind. So we, to push, uh, to give a bit of momentum, we created a new institute in 2007 in, in Cape Town. Okay? So we have three components. And in each of these components, we have research labs. For example, in Trieste, there are 15. In New Delhi, there are 30. New Delhi is about twice the size uh, of, of Trieste here. In Trieste, we're 200 people. In New Delhi, there are 400. In Cape Town, South Africa, we're, we're, it's, it's actually growing. And we hope to bring it, bring it up to Trieste standard within a few years. Trieste, sorry, Trieste numbers within a few years. So our organization is actually uh, belongs to the member states. So we have 60 plus member states. We have, uh, we have actually over almost 80 now. And our member states actually own us. And we meet once a year to decide which way to go and what projects to do, how to evolve our organization. And as you can see here, uh, most of our, most of, no, all of our member states are from uh, uh, countries with their economies in transition, okay? So what, what we do, uh, we do um, several things to promote this biotechnology in developing countries, apart from having advanced research projects in the, in, in the three components. We have our specific long terms. Uh, we have postdoc fellowships and pre-doc fellowships, which are exclusively uh, reserved to our scientists from our member countries. Okay? Uh, we, we organize many courses like this one. We, we organize about 25. Either we organize them or we sponsor them. Okay? Uh, uh, we have, uh, we're very proud of this. We have actually our own grant call once a year. We give grants to, to scientists from member countries. So I think that's a very good way, bringing money to scientists, good scientists in, in these countries that want to do research there. And then we also have uh, other, other, other uh, programs. So this is just a brief, brief, very brief overview. And some of you that will come to ICGB on Wednesday, we can, we can uh, get in more detail. We have, a, of course, updated website. And any questions we have, you can contact our director general here in, here in Trieste. So um, I'm an experimental microbiologist. And I, <laughs> I went to university in the 80s when I was taught that, that bacteria our unicellular organisms, they are completely different from multicellular organisms. You know, we have to forget about multicellularity. You know, a bacteria can live on its own, likes to live on its own, and so on and so forth. So starting uh, getting interested in quantum sensing in the late 90s, I realized that this concept that I was taught at university is probably profoundly wrong. Uh, we now believe, at least I believe, that bacteria do not want to live as solitary organisms because probably they're much more vulnerable to, to you know, to, to stresses, environmental stresses, or or predators, whereas when they live as communities, we're now learning that they can, they can do things that they cannot do, they don't like or they cannot do alone. It's like, you know, if there's a lot of, also humans, if there's a lot of us, we can do incredible things with a lot of us that we cannot do when we're alone. Maybe the concept is exactly the same with bacteria. And a lot of scientists have studied their favorite organism and have shown that uh, through quorum sensing, through the production and detection of small signals, okay, 
a community of bacteria can do uh, incredible stuff. Like they can make a biofilm, they can become virulent. You know, there's no point, you know, scientists believe, we believe microbiologists, there's no point attacking a host when there's a few of you. It's better attacking it when there's a lot of you. So synchronization of behavior, okay? We have, if we synchronize our behavior, we can be more effective, okay? And this is brought about by the cell density dependent mechanism, which we call quorum sensing. The term has been coined in 1994 by P. Greenberg and Cliff Fuqua and Steve Winans. You know, uh, this is a landmark paper, which they, they introduced the term. And, I, and, 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 and a lot of work has been done on this, and there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of literature on this. Um, and you can find in the literature a lot of signals. You know, these signals have been discovered and are continuously being discovered. This is a, this is a paper by, from Nottingham Group, which is a review published in 2009. Probably this is not complete by now. And I, I very much believe this is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to be discovered. And you can see here that the, this, the message here we have is that they're rather simple molecules. Um, you know, we, we're going to hear from Ines. She's going to talk about uh, peptides that are produced by gram-positive bacteria. We're going to hear several speakers will talk about gram-negative bacteria. Um, so uh, if, if I just start with this, with this class, these almost certain lactones, these are made by gram-negative protobacteria. And today, you know, you often read in papers the most common signal molecule, quorum sensing molecule in gram-negative bacteria. And I believe it's the most common because it's the easiest to detect, actually. It's extremely easy to, to, to look for these molecules and to, to determine the structure. So when we say most common, maybe it's a dangerous term. Maybe at the moment they're most common maybe because they are very easy to study. And what you can see here, um, over 100 species of gram-negative protobacteria have been reported to produce these kind of molecules. And just what I want to say, there's a lot of dialects. So this is a, the basic structure. And you can have the acyl chain that can vary from a 4-carbon to a 20-carbon. And in position 3, you can have a ketone or a hydroxy or a methylene group. So you have, for example, here is a, this is the molecule produced by Vibrio fischeri, the first molecule which was discovered. Uh, and this is a carbon-6 with a ketone, so 3-oxo. Uh, carbon-6 almost certainly lacked. And then you have so many different dialects produced by so many different species, which provides a bit of specificity to the system. It's very, very powerful. Uh, so you have a basal level. So bacteria, we believe, tend to produce them all the time at basal level. So at low cell density, we have low concentration. When we have a high cell density of bacteria, what we believe happens is that um, there is, uh, these, these, these almost lactones are diffusible in, in, in most cases, really rather fully diffusible. And the high, cell, high cell density, so high uh, concentration of almost lactones, there is a regulatory protein. Uh, sorry, just go back. These are made by one, uh, by one gene, which causes of almost lactone synthase, which makes use of common precursor in every living cell. One involved in fatty acid biosynthesis, the other one in a lot of enzyme reactions. Takes these two guys, makes, this, makes, the, makes the specific AHLs. High concentration of this, high cell density, there is a cognate regulator, which will specifically recognize the, the HLs that are being made. This interaction is, is, a, is, a, is can be very strong, in some cases also reversible. And this leads to uh, then the ability of this Luxar family protein to uh, affect gene expression. And it does that by other, by other uh, in a positive way, in a negative way. Uh, again, I'm generalizing. There's a lot of deviations to this theme because there's a lot of studies made on the system. But in, in general terms, we have, uh, in the, in, when we have activation, we have this Luxar protein, the detector, that uh, upon binding to the almost lactone, dimerizes, homodimerizes, and binds to promoter regions and kicks, kickstarts the RNA polymerase to activate transcription. So you can see activating transcription in response to cell density. If we have a negative scenario, uh, maybe the, 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 the dimer can bind to DNA in the promoter region, repressing the ability of the RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter. And this repression is relieved when there is high cell density because the almost lactones will bind to the, to, this, to the regular. And this then will not be unable to bind to DNA, and repression is relieved. So you can have positive. In most cases, it's positive. But there are beautiful examples also of negative regulation of, of negative regulation via, via these, these kind of signals, OK? So um, what, what, what I actually didn't say when, when I presented the slide with all the signals, and I'm very proud to say that a lot of the work, the foundation work done on this system, is actually comes from studying plant-associated bacteria, OK? 
Um, I've underlined here, um, these are examples of pathogenic bacteria that use homostrain lactose, and I've underlined here probably, probably maybe I'm wrong, uh, but probably the best studied uh, species for this quorum sensing type system. And you can see here that we have a large portion of these are plant pathogens. And the foundation work done on agrobacterium tumefaciens and Irvinia and Pantoea still are today uh, the, the leading, the leading uh, papers and textbook papers for this system. We're going to hear a lot about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pete Greenberg will talk about it. Livia will talk about it. So there will be talks about Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is probably uh, maybe the organism that has been most, mostly studied for this system. So I cannot not mention, not mention the work done, the beautiful work done on Agrobacterium tumefaciens. You know, this is a, uh, an incredible organism which has been studied for many reasons. You know, this organism, can it's, a, it's, it's a pathogen. It causes a tumor. It transfers a piece of DNA from a plasmid into a plant cell. And it's been studied for, you know, uh, for pathogenic reasons, but also for, for, its, uh, for its use by humans to create genetically modified plants. But anyway, there's, uh, I don't want to go into detail, but I, I, I have to mention the beautiful work on the quorum sensing systems, uh, almost like the quorum sensing system, which is involved in the regulation of the conjugation of the plasmid that carries, that is important for this, for this disease, as well as the copy number of this plasmid. And, and it, it's beautiful because how the system is activated through plant signals that are actually produced by the, the transferred DNA in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the plant cell. And then there's also the, the control of the system, the, the, the shutting down by lactonases and anti-proteins anti that block the regulator. So I don't, I don't get into detail, but this by far I want to say that it is so beautiful and has been studied in major contributions by, by labs of Stephen Ferran, Steve Winans, and Clay Fuqua have done beautiful work and it's really uh, a beautiful system to study in, in all its aspects. And of course, plant beneficial bacteria maybe lag a little bit behind, but a lot of scientists around the world are looking at good guys. And we, he we heard at the introduction, there's a lot, lot of you studying biological control of plant beneficial bacteria. Also, these guys use this kind of quorum sensing for their beneficial interaction with plants. Okay. And here is just by no means uh, exhaustive, but it is, there is a list here of, of good guys, rhizobiums and pseudomonas especially, that use this, this, uh, this kind of quorum sensing to regulate uh, plant beneficial interaction and, and phenotypes related to their, to their uh, symbiotic uh, life with plants. Okay. So which you know, also raises the issue that are we going to control? You know, there's a lot of, you know, in, in my view, Controlling quorum sensing can potentially be very useful in agriculture to control plant pathogens. But again, we have to be very careful because a lot of beneficial bacteria use the same system to, to have a beneficial interaction with plants. So uh, going back to this, to this uh, slide of, 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 uh, of some examples of the signals, and you can see here, and I didn't mention it, you can see here all the plant-associated plant bacteria, the xanthomonas, the xylellas, the bready rhizobium. So a lot of work is done with people like me and other scientists around the world that, that are interested in plant-associated bacteria. The other uh, family I want to talk about that is, that is receiving a lot of attention recently is this, these molecules, which is called diffusible signal factors. You know, I've been trying to catch up with the reading, but you know, it's not always easy with all the things we have to do. But these, these molecules uh, are now uh, widely found in nature. And I, and I think we should say that it's because the sensitivity detection methods have improved so much. So for that reason now, we are realizing that they're so much more common than we thought, just like the homostrain lactones, right? At first, they were confined to xanthomonas and xylella. Now we're finding a lot of them, and also we're finding a lot of different ones. And again, here, it's a family of molecules made from, you know, a very similar, made from the fatty acid uh, uh, biosynthesis pathway. And again, here, it's, it's this, just like homostrain lactones, this kind of quorum sensing. Is, 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 has beautiful, uh, beautiful work being done, and again, it's basically all plant-associated bacteria. It's also been found in burkled areas and some human opportunistic pathogens now, but the fundamental work has been done probably in Xylella fastidiosa through the, you know, the work of some Steve Lindau in Xanthomonas, the work of several people uh, in India and in the United States have, have looked at this DSF production. And again, we're talking about very serious pathogens here. I don't have to say how serious Xylella fastidiosa is for, for the United States in grapevine. And also now in Italy, we had a major Xylella fastidiosa infection in the southern Italy of olive plants. 
you know, uh, xanthomonas, again, very, very important pathogens. They attack a wide range of plants and crops. And here, you know, in, in, in Brazil, they, they affect citrus and also uh, is extremely important rice pathogen. Uh, and in these guys, they've done, again, beautiful work. And uh, unlike what, what occurs in, uh, in, 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 in the almost certain lactose, we have a classical two-component system that is involved in detection of this of this uh, of these of these diffusible signal factors. So we have a a sensor anchored in the periplasmic membrane which can detect the, the DSF and then and then can, can initiate a phosphor relay reaction and transfer the signal to, to the cell. Again, beautiful work has shown that that there is mechanisms to also keep this quorum sensing at bay. And this is a topic I think which deserves a lot of attention. Quorum sensing is very expensive metabolically. Uh, a community of cells of bacterial cells that decides to have swarm sensing on, it's committing a lot of its energy to that event. So uh, we need to make sure to be able to shut it off very efficiently and very quickly. And again, work here is now beginning to show, for example, that the sensor component can block, inter can block the RPFS, which is the synthase, the protein that synthesizes the diffusible signal factor can be inhibited by the, by the uh, sensor when there is a low cell density. And high cell density, there is a phosphor relay reaction, so the sensor will detect the, almost the, the, the DSF, transfer the phosphate to a, to a sensor, which will then affect the concentration of an intracellular messenger, which will then free a regulator, which will do its job. So again, here, it takes an extra dimension. There is an intracellular signal, which is called SACID.GMP, which is linked up to this DSF diffusible signal factor. So just, just to... Uh, to show the complexity of these systems, and in this case, TSF involving a, involving a little bit more complex uh, transmission of the signal and interacting with other components. Okay. So, the, the contribution of plant associated bacteria to quorum sensing has been fundamental and it's probably going to be also in, in the future. Uh, why is that? Because uh, I think because uh, Plants associated bacteria are so diverse. There are so many different, now with the new year of microbiomes, we are realizing uh, how complex is the microbial life next to a plant. And I think the challenges of the future, a lot of the studies I mentioned have been from experiments done on a pure culture scenario in your lab, you know, my favorite organism working, you know, uh, working on a sterile condition, making sure, you know, another thing we were taught when we joined the lab is that make sure your culture is sterile. If you get contaminated, you ruin all your results. Actually, probably that's completely wrong. If we were working with contaminated cultures back then, we, maybe our results we would get today would be maybe more realistic to what happens in nature. Because in most cases in nature, uh, bacteria do not live as solitary, as uh, not solitary, excuse me, as, as pure uh, mono-strain scenarios. Okay, there are, of course, beautiful examples of that. But when we look at plant-associated bacteria, we need to think about a multi-species scenario, and we need to think about the plant. So what I'll do in the next 20 minutes is actually talk about my work in my lab, hopefully giving some uh, now opening my mind rather than uh, sticking just to the pro daily problems and giving some messages uh, of, of, uh, of microbial community research and the way direction that I think should be going. So now I'm very interested in, in looking at the more realistic scenario of what is all this means to the plant, all this communication going on, and what about the multi-species effect? You know, these bacteria live together with so many other bacteria. So do all the scenarios I've talked about, how, how does it fit in a multi-species scenario? So I've been, I've been interested in, in, in rice for, 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 for many years, and I, I used rice as my, as my model a plant for obvious reasons. It's by far the most important crop in the world, by far even though it's not grown in the rich countries very much. Um, so, and I, I studied back then, and I looked at a lot of bacteria that live with rice. I don't want to go through all this, but uh, we looked at good guys and bad guys, and a lot of them have quorum sensing, and a lot of them, and we focused on AHLs, almost in lactose, because again, it was the easiest thing to do at that time. Very easy to detect. But we got really, we got really lucky and excited by, by the rhizosphere pseudomonas, so we had a bunch of strains from India that were isolated from the rhizosphere of rice, and we have a bunch of xanthomonas arise pathogens, okay, that, uh, that we knew made DSF, 
But uh, the, so we got about 25 from the company called Bayer, sent me 25 very pathogenic strains. And students in my lab, uh, you know, Sarah, Ferluga, and others, and here also I had a postdoc, Laura Steindler, started looking at, at uh, do they make homocysteine lactones? And what, to make a very long story short, and several years of work, the rise of your pseudomonas and the pathogens of Xanthomonas arise, they actually do not make homocysteine lactones in most cases. Some rhizosphere pseudomonas do. Okay, uh, so uh, rhizosphere pseudomonas, we, in our hands, 15 to 20% make homocysteine lactones and have different systems. It's like they've acquired them recently and they have transposons on the side, so it's like they've, it's been a recent horizontal transfer event. But they don't have a core, there are no core homocysteine lactone systems. And, and, and the xanthomonas arising, basically, we didn't, we, we didn't uh, uh, detect homocysteine lactones. All this work was done the pre, pre genomic uh, year, so it was done in 20, 2005, 2006, 2007. Then bingo, suddenly, Within, uh, as it happens with genomics, suddenly within two or three months, there was a genome of Xanthomonas arise from uh, a group in Korea, from a group in Japan, and a group in China. And now there are many genomes. And same with, with Pseudomonas. There were several genomes coming up, as well as we were contributing to some of these genomes. And what we could see from these rhizosphere good guys and the pathogenic guys is that actually they don't have the gene to make the, synth the, the, almost, the, the codes for the synthase that makes almost certain lactone. But they have the regulator. So they have a Luxar family regulator, which is very similar to Luxar family regulators that bind homocysteine lactones, as I've shown you, and either activate or repress transcription. And in fact, we, we, uh, we call these Luxar solos. Pete calls them Luxar orphans. We both call them each other. Actually, it's no problem. But, but uh, what is now evident from the genomics that these guys are extremely common. So it's very common in gram negative bacteria to have, uh, to have bacteria that have these guys devoid of a cognate homocysteine lactone synthase. So what do they do? Uh, well, um, they're not very well studied, actually. Um, and you know, works uh, of, work of Brian Hammer uh, has shown that, for example, E. coli is the model organism for having look. E. coli does not make homocysteine lactones, but it has a Luxar solo. And what uh, Brian has shown that it responds to homocysteine lactones. So it's like, uh, I don't speak, but I can listen. OK? Uh, in, the case of, in our case, we were, we were obviously trying to follow that route. Probably it could be that these guys don't have the ability to produce, but they have the ability to listen, probably of HLs produced by neighbors. There were also reports in early 2000 about, uh, uh, regarding homosterolactone mimics, so that plants produce compounds that would activate homosterolactone biosensors. So maybe, you know, there's still today that it's believed that plants produce compounds that can interfere or talk with, to these Luxar proteins. So we, we were following these two scenarios. And to make a very long story short, the work of two PhD students and one postdoc, uh, OK, Sara Ferluga and Juan Gonzalez worked as PhD students, and Sujata Subramoni as a postdoc. They basic, we basically showed that, that in the ben, good guys and in the, in, in the good rhizosphere pseudomonas and the bad guys, these two uh, Luxar proteins have evolved away have evolved away the ability to bind homocysteine lactose, but they're binding, they're binding to a plant compound. Uh, and when they do that, they are their active, they're very important for biocontrol in collaboration with, with uh, Christoph Kiel, University of Lausanne, using a cucumber and a fungus and a, and a pithium, and a, uh, my CT, pythium as a model. We've shown that this is very important for biocontrol. And in xanthomonas arise, it's important for virulence. So we've done a lot of uh, genetics, microarray, and mutants, and blah, blah, to show this. But the message I want to just give you here is that we found these, this kind of we call it subfamily of Luxar proteins. OK. So when I say biocontrol is, is uh, if we, for example, in this case, what we did the experiment, if we inoculate our cucumber plants with this guy, they would uh, uh, keep the pathogen away. And the mechanism of that is either they produce antimicrobial compounds and they also induce the immunity of the plant. So controlling uh, biologically a pathogen with another, uh, with, in this case, with a bacteria. So the message I want to give here is, is that uh, we found this family, let's call it this subfamily of Luxar proteins, which we call solos, uh, very, very common in bacteria. And this is, by no, this is a you know, three, four year old uh, tree that we constructed about this family. And you can see here, 
all these guys are plant associated. We have the rhizobiums, we have the Pseudomonas syringes, we have the Rhodobacters, the Agrobacteriums, the Xanthomonas. So we published that is, we think this is a very widespread communication system with, uh, with the plant. The message here, this is one, and I th might be, this is one of many that we still have to discover. These guys that live next to plants communicate with each other, but also have evolved the ability to communicate with the plant. And this is very important in terms of microbiome. Because in, in my view, in applications, if we understand these, these communication systems, then we can, maybe we can engineer, we can, we can uh, tailor the plant for a good beneficial recruitment of its microbiome, especially in the root. You know, the root, uh, the root, the, the soil closest to the root is called the rhizosphere. And this is often paralleled with the gut, the human gut. Because the, this, this area of the plant, uh, just to tell you, the plant releases 15% of the carbon and nitrogen that it has into the rhizosphere. And it does so, we believe, for a good recruitment of the microbiome. So if we understand this kind of communication, then we can maybe tailor the plant for a, for a good recruitment, and then we can then move on to the next generation of agriculture so we can start reducing the use of chemicals and we start making healthier, healthier plants through a good microbiome recruitment. Now, the work, this, well, probably some of you are asking, what is the signal? And P. Greenberg is, is, uh, is continuing with this, is, is very interested in this, and he's made an important contribution, and he's, and he's beginning to, to think that it could be a peptide, because a peptide transporter is, is, is involved, and also peptidase is involved. But again, uh, it will be so fantastic if he can determine what this, uh, what this family of compounds is, because then we can move on maybe to the next part, which is engineering plants, or to control pathogens and recruit good guys. So that's the message I want to give uh, with respect to, to, to that. Uh, again, I think that in terms of this kind of communication, which affects the microbiome, we are so behind. There's beautiful, beautiful communication between plants and bacteria when we talk about rhizobium, when we talk about agrobacterium. But that's it. We need to move on to the other guys that constitute the majority of the microbiome of the plants. We have to understand, in my view, have to understand how how they communicate with the plant and how they create communities by communicating with the plant. And there's a lot of work to, to be done there, I think. Okay, the last 10 minutes is, uh, is, um, is, is the other part that interests us here in Trieste, is the multi-species aspect. Uh, you know, in, as we know from a lot of microbiome uh, studies, especially uh, beneficial guys or even pathogens, they live in, in, uh, in very complex communities. So how do they do, the, how do, they do their job and how do they communicate? So I, I, was, I was lucky that I uh, accidentally bumped into this microorganism because Ta, Ta Hosni is a PhD student from Morocco that was working in Perugia. He contacted me to come to my lab to, to, to look at quorum sensing in this, in this organism. And this organism is, is a pathogen of olive. Okay? It's not a serious pathogen. It can be controlled quite easily if, if good practice is, 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 is employed by the farmer. These guys, these guys live on, on the surface, of, of, on, on the aerial surfaces, and there is a, a damage. It will get in, and it will cause a tumor, cause hyperplasia by producing uh, uh, hormones. This guy produces two or three plant hormones. Uh, don't think it's like agrobacterium. But there's no transfer of DNA to, to, to the chromosome of plants. It just does that. Uh, uh, it just does it by gene expression um, in the bacteria. So we, Taha came to the lab and we showed that this guy makes homosterin lactones. We found a system, classical system, a synthase and a regulator. We inactivated the genes and we could then inoculate one-year-old olive plants. And you can see that after 60 days, we have a good olive uh, not uh, being produced in the, when we infect with the wild type. With, when, we ha when we don't have the signal, we have a much smaller olive knot. If we don't have a regulator, we have a smaller olive knot. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know it, was not too, it, it was nice, but so many examples of plant pathogenic bacteria that use this kind of system to regulate virulence. What well, it got exciting afterwards when, when he also said to me, said to me I, I isolate a lot of bacteria from the olive nodes. You know, I take the olive node from nature and I isolate bacteria. I could, of course, I pick up the pathogen mostly, but there's other guys in the olive node. And one of the guys that, that, he, that, he, that he regularly finds is this Ervinia tolitana, which was actually classified in 2004 in Spain. Uh, as a Irina Tolitana, which this is a harmless or even beneficial uh, epiphyte, epiphyte and endophyte. So epiphyte lives on the surface, endophyte lives inside plants. I'll come to endophytes in, in the last few minutes of my talk. Uh, so this harmless or beneficial bacteria is found, abundantly found, in the, in the olive nodes. So I thought, hmm. So here we have a pathogen that 
takes a lot of his energy and is evolved to create a disease. Why does it create disease? Because it wants to grow, it wants to eat, it wants to colonize, it wants to take over the world. And, and yet, inside the olive knot, it takes other guys in. Are they cheats? Are they just there by, you know, how, how, is, it, how is the community coordinated? Is it, are they cooperating? Are they competing? And I'm not a social microbiologist, but obviously this attracted me attracted the attention. So we started working with this guy as well. And what we, what we shown, I don't have the slide, is that it has almost certain lactones. It makes almost certain lactones, excuse me. And it makes it structure the same almost certain lactone as, as, as the pathogen. Exactly the same one. It's a C8 3 ox almost certain lactone. So we made mutants of this guy, of this uh, system in this Cervinia. And then we did co-infections. So here again, this is an experiment when we uh, took one-year-old olive plants. This is done in Roberto Bonaiuro lab in the University of Perugia. Uh, so one-year-old olive plants, and he infects with the, with the wild type. And then we make co-infections with the wild type and the harmless end of um, Irvinia. And we, the first thing we saw is that when we do that, we have bigger knots. Okay. So when we have the pathogen, we have a good knot. But when we have the pathogen and the irinia, we have bigger knots. So that was a clear indication that these two guys like each other. They work better together. We then did co-infections with the wild type together, um, excuse me, with the wild, so, sorry, with the pathogen not making the, the, the almost relactose, so with the, the mutant of the synthase of the pathogen, which I already showed you in a previous slide, the, the, the knot is, is reduced considerably because it uses quorum sensing for virulence. Okay, and then when we co-infect that, that mutant together with the wild type Provinia tolitana, which I told you makes the same almost relactose, we restore the olive knot formation, all right, right. So, so the, the, the mutant of the pathogen is, is, uh, is comp it's, let's say, uh, the, the lactone is, 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 is provided by the beneficial or harmless uh, co-resident uh, co, uh, co, uh, co of the knot, uh, okay? And when we do the same experiment with the, with the Irina tolitana regulatory mutant, when we co-infect the regulatory mutant with the Irina tolitana, we don't see this because, of course, the pathogen does not have the regulator to detect the almost lactone. I hope it's clear. So it, it was, I think this work was, was very nice, and I, I, that clearly showed. I mean, this, these knots take 60 days to form. So this is a very, in my view, very stable cooperation interaction. And what is very important is that when we look at cell numbers, CFUs of the pathogen and the, of the pseudomonas and, and the ervinia, if we, have, if we look at the open, the open circles or the open triangles, these are single inoculations, and this is measuring CFUs over the 60-day period of the olive knot formation. If we do single inoculation, obviously, we see the pathogen, the knot forms, and the pathogen number increases, obviously. Uh, and when we just infect the arena alone, it's not a pathogen. We just infect it. The number goes down dramatically. When we put them together, the two wild types, we can see, and we go look at the numbers, the pathogen goes up significantly. So the pathogen can grow better when the ervinia is present. And look at dramatically the ervinia. The ervinia now can grow when the pathogen is there. So, so uh, we then, uh, Daniel Passos, a uh, uh, PhD student from Brazil, spent time in my lab. He, was then, he then went to Caio Ramos' uh, uh, lab in the University of Malaga, which is probably the best scientist that looks at the virulence mechanism of these guys. And he has a beautiful microplantlet system, quick system. Uh, that, he, that he has to infect small plants of olives. And, we, and, and so we marked the, the pathogen green, uh, constitutive green, and, 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 and the arena constitutive red. And he could show very clearly that these two guys co localizing the olive knot through the period a lot many days, and they're very happy together. The red and the green embed with each other and, and are very happy living together. So what do we do now? We, we did several things, and we're not making good progress, actually. Uh, so I'm very discouraged, and I don't, you know, and uh, we hope to pick it up again and pick up some positive results. So we've done the, the uh, quorum sensing regulon in both systems, and we have all the genes that are regulated by the by the in the pathogen and in, and in the ervinia by quorum sensing. We've done some phenotypic microarray to see what kind of metabolism uh, is is going on in the pathogen and the wild type, and in the pathogen and in the and in the Irvinia, and we see them when we put them together, when we, call, when we make a phenotypic microarray of them together, we, we, we have better, better metabolism. You know, we use a, biolog, a lot of biolog plates for that in collaboration with Stefano Mocali in Florence. We did that. He has computer programs to detect this, this kind of, uh, um, this kind of uh, these biolog plates. 
so, um, so, so also what we've done, we've shown here, is along, along, the, side, along the talk of Daniel, even though we're not, uh, we're not very good at bioinformatics, but Daniel was actually, uh, spent a lot of time, and it was actually, he actually looked at the metabolism of the single, or, or in the Arvinia alone, and in the, and in the uh, pathogen alone, and then in both together we seem to increase metabolic potential, obviously. We have more genes together. We, the pan-genome of both together has more metabolic potential. So together with the, these three uh, pieces of, of data, the, the, the quorum sensing regulon, which we know is important for virulence, and, and they share the signals, as I've shown you, the phenotypic microarray, and this silico data, we're working on a set of compounds that are present in the plant and might be involved in what Daniel mentioned in a, in a, in a, in, in a better light, in a better metabolic profile when these two guys are together, both benefiting from each other in, 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 the, metabolism of the, in the metabolism of these compounds. This is where we are. So here, you know, uh, the signals I want to give, uh, these guys to share HS signals. Uh, from our, from our um, regular data, from sensing regular metabolic pathways, metabolic complementary, in my view, can play a very important role. And, and I think this is a model to study. Could be a very nice model to study this kind of metabolic interaction and signaling between a pathogen and a, and a beneficial or harmless. Uh, so again, the concept of pathobiome. Now we, 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 we have this word in, in the literature, pathobiome. So the, 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 you know, the, uh, we have to think of the pathogen coming to the plant, uh, meeting a lot of other guys. And maybe in some cases, the guys that it meets actually have evolved to, to collaborate and join up to do a better job uh, of being, uh, in, in this case, increasing the, uh, the ability to make, to make the olive node and to cause disease and to, and to proliferate. Finally, I, I want to finish up because again here I think there's a I think there's an important message in terms of community we we've been interested in, in my lab now for for a few years on this uh, aspect of beneficial using bacteria to to fortify the plant uh, to improve the microbiome of the plant so we can decrease the use of chemicals in the, in, in agriculture you know most uh, it is believed that 99 percent of additives in agriculture at the moment are chemical we just cannot afford to go like that so there's a big interest worldwide by private companies and also labs to bring this down. And I read, uh, and in my reading, I realized that they want to bring it down by at least 90% by 2020. And the biggest promise as an alternative is the microbial inoculants, right? So we are, we are trying to, to get into this field, and we're using endophytes. And endophytes are, are, in most cases, recruited from the soil, and there are bacteria that can get into the plant. The mechanism of entry is still rather unclear but they can get in through the roots and some of them can actually uh, migrate up and live in intercellular spaces inside the plant. And in many cases, they're beneficial. They can produce hormones, they fix nitrogen, uh, they keep pathogens away, okay? So we had a, uh, we had a big project on rice, well, big. We had a, a grant uh, for Italian standards, rather a big grant in, in rice. And we, we, we are, the, Italy is the biggest rice producer in Europe, okay? So, so we, we um, we went to, Italians eat rice once a week, which is, in terms of Asia, it's a joke, but this is what we do, and I, uh, in general, our family will, will make risotto once a week. So we went out there in, in the Italian uh, areas where they grow rice, and we, had a, we went out to isolate endophytes. I don't want to spend too much time how we did it, but we, we took uh, plants which are, live, which are grown in submerged or non-submerged conditions. We, 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 looked and we isolate endophytes from the roots, from the stem, from the leaves, and a different growth phase. Because as we, as we hear, there's a lot of parameters. How you grow your plant, where you grow it, uh, where you select your endophytes. Some endophytes will get into the root and stay there. Some endophytes will get up to the stem. Some endophytes will get up to the leaves. So we tried to, do, we tried to cover as much as possible. So we did several samples. And, and of course, we looked at also the microbiome and we, in, in roots, uh, dry submerged, leaves. Again, we, ha we have published all this data. And we see some differences. But what I want to talk about here is that we actually have a collection of 1,013 isolates. This is the work of Iris, Iris Bertani, and now postdoc Felix Moronta, who also has a poster, uh, is doing now. So we have a very large collection. Trust me, working with 1,318 bacteria is a lot of work. So we have this collection, and we started doing some classification. But uh, again, to make a long story short, we cannot work with 1,318 1, isolates. It's impossible. 
big companies can do that, we can't. So we, through a series of uh, uh, shoot, shooting in the dark and some uh, semi-logical uh, um, you know, ways to reduce the number, uh, we classified and then we did some in vitro tests. You know, it's easy in, in vitro. You can check so many things. Does it make antimicrobial compounds? Does it make oxygen? Does it swarm? Does it swim? But again, I find those rather limiting because you, know, you have a bacteria that doesn't have these phenotypes in the lab, then it might have them all in, in, in the plant, right? So you can do that, but again, you have to, uh, we, we were rather um, flexible in, 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 in uh, then you know, uh, choosing the ones we want to continue with. So we, have, uh, we had a set of 218 isolates, which we, after we did in vitro, we boiled down to 48. And these 48 are rather different species, different phenotypic profiling. And these 48, we started to do uh, work with the plant again. And with some, we can get them in. With 21 endophytes, we can, we can then uh, re put them inside the plant by single inoculations. 27, we couldn't. I'll come back to that. And then some of them had plant growth promoting effect. Others didn't. But again, working all the time with single inoculants. We are together with the Joint Genome Institute in, in, in Walnut Creek in California. We have a community project that will sequence all these 48. We're now sequencing all these 48 genomes, so we're going to have a sequence of these. But what we're really interested is, of these 48, in terms of signaling uh, that I'm interested in, is do they have interspecies? Do they communicate with each other? We're trying to reconstitute uh, microbiome. So we're doing this work right now. We're working with these 48, trying to think of uh, communication and community as well as, well as applications. Uh, and what, uh, what Felix is, is doing in my lab, which I, I think we just started to do that, is, is the concept of a simplified microbiome. So we take, rather than we've done all the single inoculations, and now, personally, I don't like that, we're now doing inoculations as a group, okay? So we can take 10, 10 to 30 strains that, of these 48 and inoculate them together to the plant. And then we can look at plant growth promotion, or we can then look at community structure, how, which ones get in, which one forms community. And the message I want to finish with is that, yes, the consortium is also having a beneficial effect, at least in the lab. The plants grow a bit more. There's more dry weight, wet weight, and all that. We haven't done any challenging with pathogens yet. But the, the, the message I want to leave with is that we get different results from the single inoculums. So an endophyte which you isolated, when we infect the plant alone, we cannot get it inside. But when we infect them as a group, Initial experiments are telling us clearly that the, the profile is completely different. So I think, I think, again, we have to be very careful. You know, a single a bacteria that can go in on its own and, uh, and bacteria which cannot go in on their own, but in the end, when we put them together with others, they can get inside. So I think this is a very important point that we, again, working with purified single scenarios could be the wrong way to go. And again, we have to always think what happens out there when these endophytes get into plants in nature, they're surrounded by so many other species. And even entry can be affected by this community, either in communication. Maybe some bacteria don't have the mechanisms to get in, but they can benefit from the mechanism of others. Maybe bacteria can stick to each other, and one guy can get in, and the other guy can follow in. Lots of different scenarios. So we're very interested in that. And it's not going to be easy to study, but uh, again, the message I want to give, again, let's think about the nature. Uh, think about what happens out there and try to design our experiments uh, as closely as possible to, to the real scenario. Okay, I think I finished. So, oops, that was good. So I, I, I tr try to, uh, to mention everybody along the way. The, here is my group in bold, and they're all here, so I hope you can interact with them. We also, uh, Felix also has a poster about this last point that I made, uh, so he'll be able to, to, to talk to you about this. And uh, I, I have collaborated, you know, very important collaborations with which I, I, I you know, the, the field is so multidisciplinary. If we don't collaborate, uh, it's difficult to make good progress. And, um, and the funding is, uh, is, 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 being, is coming along. In Italy, it's not easy, I mean, to, to get funding for this kind of work. But we, so far, we, we are managing to, to stay above water. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.